Well, welcome to Living Springs. We are glad that you're able to join us for worship. And uh, we ask that uh, if you're able, if you want to sing along, that would be great. Um, and uh, we hope that this will bless you and, uh, and uh, your family uh, during this time. Good night or good afternoon, whenever it is you happen to be watching this. We want to welcome you uh, to joining us here in worship here at Living Springs. We are grateful uh, that you have tuned in and are watching even now. And we pray that this service would be a blessing to you and all of those who are watching. Also, we want to remind you that if this is a blessing to you, go ahead and sh click the share button or share this with anybody who you think just might need to hear these words and this service this morning. All right, I got a couple of announcements for us as we jump in today, and that is starting with uh, our graduations. Um, we know that we are in a season, and it is that time of year, where we honor our graduates. This year, it is a little bit more complicated, as many of you all know, and we are hoping to honor our graduates in a really special way. So within the next couple of weeks, we are hoping that if you are living with a graduate or you yourself are a graduate, that you would get us a picture and your name and the information of where you are graduating from, as, along with where you are planning to go. 
And we are encouraging you to go ahead and to give that to us and send that to us at info at livingspringscc.org. Once again, info at livingspringscc.org. We are hoping that to honor those who are graduating in a really special way here soon. Secondly, we have the Be the Church Challenge. And we want to encourage you to take part in being a blessing to your community and beyond. We have many ways you can get involved in doing that. All you have to do is log on uh, to your app and go ahead and check that information out there or check our website for more information. One particular way you can be a blessing in the Be the Church Challenge is we, are, we have gift cards to local restaurants where we are encouraging those of you in our body who want to pick up a card and give it to somebody who might be in need, of neighbor who might be in need. Um, we encourage you to stop on over and grab a gift card to one of these local restaurants and do that. Uh, just call the office for more information if you have any questions regarding that. Third, on May 30th at 9 a.m., we are going to be planting flowers out here in our North Circle. We are asking if you are able and willing to help us get a little dirty and plant some flowers and beautify this building to go ahead and to, uh, to contact us at info at livingspringcc.org or call the church office at 708-709-0100 and let us know that you plan on participating in that. We would love to have you help us with that. And finally, as always, we want to encourage you to continue to give both here and uh, to what God is doing here and around the world. And so we encourage you to go ahead and click the Give button either on the app or on our website. You can also go ahead and stop in the office and drop off any offerings you have or mail them to us as well throughout the week. But we pray that most of all that this service would be a blessing to you and that God would further his kingdom even in this moment that we are in, in this season we are in, that God's love would explode out from just here into the whole community. Join me in prayer as we enter back into worship. Father of glory, we thank you for your presence. God, we are grateful for your presence, that it does not just dwell in a building, but God, that we are the church, that you've invited us, God, to be those who partner with you in what you are doing, God, here and around the world, in our own communities, in our own living rooms. And God, even now, Holy Spirit, we just pray that your presence would increase wherever we're at, wherever we're watching this from. Holy Spirit, we love you. God, we love you. We're in this for you. God, we don't just strive right now, God, to, to get better, to do this or to do that. God, we cease our striving right now and we set our eyes on you. Jesus, you are our hope. You are our joy. You are the winds of refreshing to our soul. And God, we ask you even now, Holy Spirit, would you come and fill your people? Would you come and fill us with joy? Come and fill your people, God, with something we can't get from this world, a love that is supernatural, a love that is unending, a love that transforms us to look more and more like you, Jesus. Lord, even now, we give ourselves to you. Come and have your way here today in the name of Jesus. So some of you might uh, recognize this, uh, this next song wait a minute, that, that's from a movie, that's, that's not a worship song. But uh, as I was listening to it a, a few weeks ago, I realized that the lyric of this song is, is a beautiful, is a beautiful worship lyric. Especially now, because often during times of difficulty, we are afforded an opportunity to turn our eyes away from all of the things that we pursue in our lives that aren't really important and to instead focus them on what is most important, our Heavenly Father.
I saw the sun begin to dim and felt that winter wind blow cold. A man learns who is there for him when the glitter fades and the walls won't hold. It's from that rubble what remains can only be what's true. If all was lost, there's more I've gained because it led me back. To you. And from now on, these eyes will not be blinded by the lights. From now on, what's waited till tomorrow starts tonight. tonight. And let your promise in me start. Like an anthem in my heart from now on. From now on. Champagne with kings and queens, the politicians praise my name. But those are someone else's dreams, the pitfalls of the man I became. For years and years, I chased their cheers at the crazy speed of always needing more. But when I Let's wait until tomorrow starts tonight. It starts tonight. Let your promise in me start. Like an anthem in my heart from now on. From now on. And we will come. Let's wait until tomorrow starts tonight. It starts tonight. Let your promise in me start. Like an anthem in my heart from now on. From Let's wait until tomorrow starts tonight. It starts tonight. Let your promise in me start. Like it anthem in my heart from now on. From
From now on. Unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance for my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. From a mother's womb, you have chosen me. Your love has called my name. I've been born again to your family. Your blood flows through my veins. Amen. What a wonderful prayer. What a wonderful way to start worship, to remind us that we don't have to live in fear, to remind us who we are, that we are children of God. We are not orphans. We have not been left alone. We don't have to be fearful, anxiety-ridden. 
wondering what's going to happen, wondering who's going to take care of us. No longer have to, we no longer have to be afraid. We are children of God. Father, we thank you. Thank you for that awesome reminder. Thank you, Lord God, for reminding us who we are and whose we are. Thank you for reminding us, Lord God, that you have us. Thank you for reminding us, Lord God, that uh, the world does not, uh, does not hold our life. The world does not hold our future. The, lo- the world does not control what happens with us. You control us. We are your children, adopted, claimed, set free, set apart. Lord, we thank you for that privilege. We thank you for that blessing. We thank you for that truth that we have with you here today. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Speak to our hearts, Lord God, as we need to hear from you. All around us, we're hearing messages of doom and gloom. All around us, Lord God, we're seeing people sick and dying, and around us, we're seeing businesses closing and people are struggling and trying to figure out which way to go, which way is up and which way is down. But Lord God, we need to be reminded all the time that we are yours. And so, Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of coming into your presence. We're thankful, Lord God, for the privilege of prayer. We're thankful, Lord God, for the privilege of worship. We are thankful, Lord God, for the privilege of your word, the fact that we have your word available to us. Your word is a light. Your word is a lamp. Your word gives us the hope. Your word gives us power. Your word gives us strength. Your word gives us vision that we don't have to stay stuck in right now, but we have the hope of vision that tells us that you have a plan for us and that we can bring the hope of that plan based upon the confidence and the surety of your word. We can bring that plan into the present to give us the confidence to continue to move forward into our future a future that has been secured by you. So, Father, we love you and we thank you. We ask, Father God, that as we look into your word right now, we ask, Father God, that you would hide your servant behind the cross of Calvary. We ask, Lord God, that his idiosyncrasies may not be seen. We ask, Father God, that only Jesus Christ would be lifted up because you promised that if Jesus was lifted up, that you would draw all men to yourself. And so we ask, Lord God, that Jesus be lifted up and that your word be preached, that your word be spoken, that your word be true, and that, Lord God, in nothing that we would do would detract from your word or distract people from your word. So, Father God, we love you and we thank you. We look forward to what you want to say to us here today. It's in the strong and the matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. All God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad that you have chosen to spend your morning with us and you've chosen to come and to worship with us here at Living Springs. Whether you are a member of our church and, and you are present with us online or whether you are watching us from somewhere around the country or around the world or maybe you just stumbled on um, this website you just stumbled onto this uh, recording, uh, and you are here. And so I'm telling you, it is not a mistake uh, that you are here with us today. God wanted you here with us today because God has a word for you today. God has something that he wants you to know, to feel, to do today. And so I pray that you will spend um, the next several moments with us and that your hearts and minds will be open to what it is that God wants to say to you here today. So here's the question as we look at this idea of when you know better, you can do better. We're in this midst of this series. We've just started this series of navigating the new normal. And the reality is that we're not going to go back to the way things were three months ago. There's going to be a new normal. Now, those changes may be small. They may be large. We don't know what those changes are. But we know that some things will never be the same again. Uh, we know that uh, there, there are changes as we think through those, what those changes may be. There is a new normal what's going to be. The things that we did 10 years ago, we won't be doing them 10 years from now. We won't be doing them 10 months from now, maybe not even 10 weeks from now. 
The way we did church is going to be different. The very fact that we are, we are doing this service online right now tells us that that is going to be something that is going to shift for many churches. Right now, there are pastors on Facebook that didn't even have a Facebook account three months ago. But now they're finding that they need to reach out to people um, through this digital age. There are going to be people who are going to be on Zoom calls and going to be using Zoom for prayer meeting in the ways that they have never done before. Uh, the, the church will look different. We may have smaller services and children's ministry will look different. So many things will be normal, will be different. And some people have been asking me, well, what does it look like? What does it feel like to pastor a church during this time? And the thing that I've been saying is like changing the oil on a moving car. We have to continue moving forward, but at the same time, there are changes that we have to make in order to be able to move forward later. And so it is challenging, but yet there is this new normal, and I am excited about the new normal. In no way am I discouraged about what's happening because I believe, as I continue to say with Isaiah 43, 19, God is doing a new thing. And because God is doing a new thing, he says, don't you perceive it. It is up to us to be aware of what God is doing, to be leaning into what God is doing, to be learning what God is doing, and to be joining God and what God is doing, and to not complain about the new normal, but to praise God for the new normal, because I believe God is going to do something phenomenal in us. And so, as we look at this, the, what I want to talk to you about tonight is this topic of when we know better, we'll do better. I'm thinking about the song um, that was just sung. I'd never heard it before, but we are moving on. The, the, the new day starts today. It doesn't start yesterday. There's a, there's a new day that is starting, and we're moving on because something more is coming. Something better is coming. Not something worse, but something better is coming. But you can't lean into that better if you don't know what that better is. And so I understand that when you know better, you'll do better. So here's, I want to start with this question. Have you ever had a, a performance review at your job. <clears throat> Most of us uh, get called into the, the boss's office or our supervisor's office, and there's this written format we go through where they tell us, uh, where they, they say, well, this is what you've done this year. That job, that usually looks like this, maybe four parts to that review. There are, there's the commendation part where they praise you, man, you've been doing a great job on this, 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 and this. And they commend you for how well you have done your job or how well you have conducted yourself in some specific areas. Then there's the critique phase of the review. The critique phase is where they say, well, here's some areas where you're falling a little bit short of expectations. Here are some things that you need to do in order to up your game a little bit. Here are some areas where you have fallen down. It is the critique phase. Then there's the corrective action phase. The corrective action phase is the plan of action for you to fix the problem areas. It is the plan of action where you say, okay, we see what, what, where you've fallen down. Now, this is how you need to fix it. This is how you get better. Then finally, there's the, consequ there's the consequences phase of the job review where it says that where you, they let you know what will happen if you fail to take seriously this review and if you fail to, to, to enact what you put in place or what you put on paper for your, correction phase, your corrective action phase. If you don't do this, you may be demoted. If you don't do this, you will be fired. If you don't do this, you won't get a raise. There are consequences for you failing to respond properly to the corrective action. And even though we don't always enjoy this process, the reality is that it's actually a good thing. It's a good thing because when you know better, you can do better. When you know what's wrong, then you can fix it. If you don't know what's wrong, you can't fix it. If you don't realize you're falling short, then you just stay short. If you don't realize there's a problem, then you don't do anything to come up with a solution. You see, when you know better, you do better. And in our text today, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, what we see is that Jesus, or as he's, as he's called in this text, 
the Son of Man gives the church at Ephesus a performance review. Please open your Bibles. It's not going to be on the screen. I want you to open your Bibles or your cell phones or your iPads or whatever you're using. And I want you to turn them to turn it to Revelations chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And it says this, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things that you do, all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I, don't, I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered that they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how, you, look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works that you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Anyone who has ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. So let's look at Jesus' review of the church at Ephesus. Look at Jesus' review. The first thing he talks about is this con con commendation phase. He says, I know all the things that you do. I know all of the things that you have done. I, I see your works. And what he's doing is that he is praising them for what they have done as a church. He says, I see what you've done. I'm looking at you. He says, you work hard. He says, you have shown perseverance under trial. When, when the things got difficult, he says, you didn't quit. He says, you don't put up with sin. You look for sin. You weed sin out. He says, you, don't, you, don't pr you protect yourself from false prophets and false teachers and from false doctrines, which means that they must study the Word of God to understand what is right and what's wrong. He says, I see you, and that's awesome what you've done. But then he moves to the next phase. He moves to the critique phase, and he says, but I have this against you. Here is a problem. Here are some problems that I've seen. And this problem is very, very succinct. He said, you don't love me, and you don't love each other as you did at first. I, I find it interesting that he contrasted all of the good things that they did, but there was only one critique, but that critique was enough to say there are serious consequences if you don't do this one thing. We're going to come to that later. He says, you don't love me like you used to. You don't do those things that you did when we first started. Then he said, there's some corrective action that you must take. He says, I want you to look inside of yourself. Consider who you are. He said, look at how far you have fallen. Take a look back. Go back to where you started. Look at the things that you did when you first fell in love with me. And now look at the things that you are doing now. And I want you to realize how far you have fallen. And just like with a performance review, they often give us the review and they say, we want you to sign it if you agree with us on this. Jesus is saying here to us, you need to decide whether you agree with me about what, how far you have fallen. I want you to do an evaluation, and I'm going to do an evaluation, and I want you to tell me, do they line up? But then he says something very important. He says you need to repent. And so you won't repent if you won't, don't agree that you have fallen far. He says then you need to repent and make the commitment to address the issues that I have pointed out. You need to go back. Then finally, he said to them, he went to the consequence phase. He told them, he says, I need you to take this seriously. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You see, he wasn't just saying everybody has ears, but not everybody hears with their ears. You may physically hear. You may auditorily hear. You may receive the words and 
process the words and process the, the, the sentences and the structure and the construct of what has been said. You may physically receive that, but that does not mean that they hear it with their hearts and they are willing to, to, to internalize it and make it their own. He says, he who has ears, I want you to hear. He says, because if you fail to change, if you fail to change, I will come and I will remove the lampstand. I will remove my presence. I will remove your anointing and your power and your influence. This is God's, this is Jesus' evaluation of the church at Ephesus. Let me tell you something. I believe that one of the things that Jesus is doing for the church, one of the things that our boss, the head of this body, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. I believe that one of the things that Jesus is doing with us during this time of isolation, during this time of shelter in place, during this time of church shutdown where we're preaching to empty churches and, and preaching to screens rather than screens, during this time when we are having to stop and to slow down and to try to change the oil in a moving car, during this time, I think that one of the things that Jesus is doing is giving us an opportunity to do a performance review. He's given us an opportunity, and he's coming to us and saying, listen, there's some commendation, there's some things that you've done well, but here is my fault with you, and you need to correct that, and if you don't correct it, there will be consequences. He is saying that to us individually, and he is saying it to us as the church. He is telling Living Springs, and he is telling Holy Rock Missionary Baptist Church, and he's telling Cornerstone, and he's telling every church on the planet, this is the time for you to stop and to do a performance review. He is saying to the worldwide church, the body, those who claim to be his children, he's saying, I need you to make sure you are properly representing me to the world. This is the time to do the performance review. It is not the time to whine and to moan. It is the time to stop and to take stock and to see whether or not we are fulfilling what we, the, the, the job and the mission that God has, promised, that has, has called us to do. What does that look like for us? Again, what is Jesus' review? Let's go right back through the cycle again. Jesus says the commendation phase. He says, what are we doing? What have you been doing well? Let me tell you some things I've seen you're doing well. But I think these are also some questions. I'm just going to answer this in the, in, 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 in the form of questions that we need to be asking ourselves if we're going to commend ourselves. Let's ask ourselves some questions. Are we working hard to advance the kingdom, or are we simply working hard to advance our kingdom? How are we handling the pressure of this pandemic? How are we handling that? Are we persevering, or are we straining and struggling and being crushed by the pressure of the pandemic? How are you handling that? How are we standing firm against the world's efforts to destroy and to distract us? Are we faithfully teaching and preaching the Word of God? Are we showing effort to reject sin and live holy lives? I believe as we look at those things, God can say, I think you're doing a lot of those things, and you do, you got great programs, and you've built buildings, and you've built hospitals. You have TV shows, and, and you're sending the gospel around the world. Those are wonderful things that you're doing. But God says at the same time, that's the condom, con commendation. Praise God for the great things that we're doing. But see, if we want to get better, we got to know better. <laughs> and when we know better, we can do better. And so, therefore, we need to know what we're not doing right. And we need to challenge ourselves and say, God, how do you want us to change? What, the, what is the critique? What do we need to do better? What do we need to do better? And so when he says this, God is basically saying, I want you to check your heart. Because what did he tell the church at Ephesus? He says, the problem that you have 
is that you don't love me and you don't love others the way you used to. So we need to check our hearts. We need to put the stethoscope to our spiritual hearts and say, God, am I loving you the way I did when I first accepted Christ? Am I loving my brothers and sisters? Am I showing love in the world the way you are telling me I'm supposed to love? How do I measure up? When I looked at this question, I thought about how do I know, how do we know if we love God? You see, the defining characteristic of the church is not the activities in which we engage, but how we love. That is the defining characteristic of the church. Not the how jamming our choir is, how, how charismatic our pastor is, how great our preaching is, how beautiful our building is, how wide our influence is in terms of the number of people coming. No, you see, the true characteristic of the church, the most important characteristic of the church is our love. They shall know we are Christians by our love. They will know you are my followers because by the way that you love. And that starts with loving God. And so how do we know that? We look at this Matthew 25 passage. Someone asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus says, I'm not changing my story. I have not changed my story. The most important thing for you as a follower of me is your love language. Do you love me with everything that you have? And do you love other people with everything that you have? That is the measure of your faith, and that is the measure of your spirituality. Do you love me? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. (laughs) He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me because they love me My Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Folks, I want you to understand something. In this time of of isolation, in this time of evaluation, we are moving to a place where it is going to be, as a friend of mine said it so nicely yesterday, he says, you either need to paint or get off the ladder. We are coming to a point in America and in our country and in this world where as a Christian, you won't be able to be a cultural Christian. You will either say yes to Jesus or you will say no to Jesus. There will be nothing in between. And so, therefore, as the followers of Christ, during this time, we need to not question truth. There's a time when we are questioning traditions and questioning what we have always done and questioning how we're going to do things in the future. One thing that we cannot begin to question is the truth of the Word of God. We must double down on truth. We must be committed to living as people who are unquestion- who, will, who will unquestionably obey the principles of Christ. You see, the Word of God, we should not, should not just inform us. It should define us. The Word of God should not just be one of many things that we look to to say, oh, yes, those are nice principles. Yes, those are nice platitudes. Those are nice things that I listen to. And we, Yeah, they're nice. No, they, the, the Word of God is not just nice. The Word of God is not just one of many things. The Word of God must be the thing on which your life is built, and nothing stops that. It must be the foundation. It must be the walls. It must be the roof. It must be the ceiling. It must be the attic. It must be the basement. It must be everything. And that is what God is saying. I need you to get back to that. Stop trying to change my word in order for it to fit your, your, your constructs and your understanding of life. God doesn't care about what you think. God says, 
my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so far are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. It is not your thoughts that matter. God's thoughts are what matters. And if your life does not match up with God's Word, don't try to change God's Word. Change your life to bring it into alignment with the Word of God. The Word of God must define us, not inform us. The second thing, he says, you don't love me the way you should, and you don't love your people the way you should. Now, this is where it gets a little dicey on me, so y'all stay with me here now. He said, how do we love people? Someone asked Jesus that question, and Jesus talked to them, and Jesus was talking to, the, to these Pharisees and to these religious people. And if you look at that passage in Matthew tra- chapter 25, I'm not going to read that whole chapter to you, but if you, you need to read that chapter for the content, for the context. And Jesus said, hey, listen, I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was in prison, and you didn't you didn't help me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. And the people said, whoa, 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 Jesus, what are you talking about? We've never seen you naked. Well, of course we would have fed you. Of course we would have clothed you. Of course we would have visited you. Verses 45, Jesus says, they will reply, Lord, when, we, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help, the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. I want you all to hear me clearly now. I'm going to try to calm down a little bit and try to give you a word here that really is on my heart right now. As the people of God, as the people of God, when we say we are pro-life, we need to be pro-all life, not just some life. We need to be pro every life. We need to be pro people, pro living. We need to be pro living, not just substandard, but not just making it. We need to be saying, wait a minute, I am for every person and I am willing to stand up for people. You see, we must be allies and advocates for those people who live on the edge, those people who are invisible to society. We have to stay. If we're going to be the people of God, we must stand with those who have been marginalized. We must protect the weak and the vulnerable among us. We must speak for the voiceless, those whose voices get, get drowned out in the noise of culture. That is who God has called us to be. I am convinced that the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan was not just some kind of a moral tale about be nice to people. It was a story, it was an indictment of the church that the church looks at people who are broken, who are on the edge, who are laying in the road beat up by the devil, and instead of helping them and loving them, we give them a hard time for being on the road at night. God is saying you must speak for the edge people. You must live on the edge. Let me, get, let me be even more clear about what I'm saying. And I'm going to tell you because this is probably what has been, I have been wrestling with this all week, and I wasn't sure how the Lord wanted me to deal with it. And this is where I'm going with this. All week I have been wrestling with the latest lynching. Yeah, I said it. The latest lynching of an African-American man. Young man running, walking in the neighborhood, and someone thinks that he is stealing something. And as they deal with that, as they look at him, they look at him and they, they track this young man down, and they choose to shoot him, kill him. And then they try to slander him and say he was something that he was not. There's a lot I can say about it, but I'm, I'm, I don't want to say a whole lot about it because I think I'll get into myself. But I can tell you, I have been struggling with the fact that not just because of Ahmaud Arbery, 
But I have been struggling over the years and I spent the last several years with the fact that my color keeps getting weaponized. That I am dangerous only because I am a black man. That I am some kind of way a hazard to the world because I am threatened because my, I am darker hue. I've struggled with that. I've struggled with the quiet rage that I have. And let me be completely and totally honest with you. I struggle with it as a pastor of a, of a multicultural church. I struggle with it because I wonder, wait a minute, am I muting my voice because I don't want to upset my white friends and my white congregants? I'm going to upset you. Because it's, I get angry. And I keep going, wait a minute, I thought we were pro-life. What about my life? What, 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 about, what about the life of this person that scares you? What about my life scares you? What about my presence scares you? You say, Pastor, why in the world are you bringing up race and racism in a sermon? about navigating the new normal. Let me give you three reasons why I'm bringing this up. You see, <laughs> I would love to never have to talk about race and racism again. I would love to not have to look at our, at, at our vision statement that says igniting a movement of spirit-filled multicultural churches that radically blesses our world and beyond. I, I would love to be able to take out the multicultural part because we don't have to be intentional about that anymore. I would love to never have to talk about shootings and murders and lynchings. I would love to be able to not talk about that anymore. But as long as, it sti as, long as racism still traumatizes the souls of our brothers and sisters and stains the fabric of this nation, I must keep talking about it. But beyond my personal pain, there is an even larger issue that we, that we, are, that this is, that we are facing. And it is the impact that it is having on the witness of the church. You see, when our young people who are deeply concerned about issues of justice see injustice happen and fail to see or hear the church speak in righteous indignation against it or move in decisive action to address it, it effectively lowers the volume of our voice one more decibel. And eventually, as that volume gets lowered and lowered, eventually our voice will be muted. You see, silence on issues of justice mutes our voice on issues of faith because they're saying you are perpetrating. You don't care about people. You only care about your institutions. And you only care when it meets your needs. And I'm challenging us as the church it is time for us to do better. We got to do better. We have to do better. I want you to understand something else. I want you to understand that racism radicalizes the wounded. Racism radicalizes the wounded. You see, when persistent racism is piled on top of historical and ongoing trauma, those experiencing that trauma become susceptible to the messages that suggest a more radical means to protect themselves and to be heard. Any of you who followed the civil rights movement may have known of a young man named Stokely Carmichael, and Stokely Carmichael was the head of the student nonviolent Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, SNCC. And, student, and, 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 and Stokely walked with Martin Luther King, and he says, we shall overcome, and he hooked arms with Dr. King, and he believed wholeheartedly in the nonviolent in the, in the non movement. And then he became a freedom rider, and he found himself getting beat time and time and time again. 
He found himself getting put in prison and getting beat up and his head bloodied. And after a while, the persistent racism that was poured on top of the already wounded spirit, the already traumatized soul, eventually radicalized him and he gave up his nonviolent ways and he said, he joined those who said, by any means necessary, I will protect myself. Let me tell you something, and I'm out of time. If we do not deal with this issue, if as a church we do not stand up, if as the evangelical church we do not stand up and immediately decry racism, immediately decry domestic terrorism, immediately look at issues of justice in not some kind of way, uh, explain it through our political lens or through our whatever lens we choose to look at through our people, our past, and our politics. If we do not do that, we will lose every generation from the millennials down. Because they will say, you are hypocrites. How dare you talk to me about the love of God How dare you hold up the cross of Christ and say that Jesus was hung on a tree and then you go and you hang me on a tree. (laughs) Folks, we know better. We got to do better. We got to do some introspection. We have to pay attention. We have to look at this and say, God, what are you saying to us? We, got, we have to look at this and say, God, am I loving the way I'm supposed to? Am I loving you the way I'm supposed to? Am I loving people the way I'm supposed to? What does God see when he puts the stethoscope to your spiritual heart? Will he find a heart that beats strongly with the deep passion for people, for him and his people? Or will his examination reveal a damaged vessel, one that is weakened by the heart condition of unconcern, apathy, and distracted living? What will he find? Talked to a good friend of mine the other day, an older gentleman, an old mentor, and I called him up and he said, Jay, the doctors told me that my heart is operating at about 3%. He says, "I'm I'm borrowed time. What will God find when he puts the stethoscope to your heart? Let me close with this thought. Consequences. We must change (laughs) or else. We must do something different than what we have been doing or else. Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen up, pay attention to all that I'm saying to you. He wants us to understand that if we don't do something different, if we don't take this time and do something different, he says, there's going to be serious consequences. And the serious consequences is this. He says, I will come and I will remove your lampstand. He's eventually saying that the lampstand was the light. And he is essentially saying, either you fix this, either you come clean, either you get your act together and begin to love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and begin to love people the way that I loved you. Either you do that, or he says, I will take the lampstand from among you. Other words, my life, my light will lead you. And he says, when my light leads you, leaves you, so does my anointing, so does my power, so does my presence, so does your influence in the world. God is saying, either you passionately love me and love my people, or you face a diminished influence in the world. Matthew says, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. God says, I will not put up with trees that don't bear fruit. Listen, y'all, I believe this. I believe that when we know better, we do better. I believe that now that you've heard, you you will take this challenge. This is your Be the Church challenge. 
be the church. Look deep within yourselves, and I'm not accusing you of anything. I hope you didn't hear that. I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm saying, Jesus, turn the light upon me. I'm saying, Jesus, check my heart. Jesus, do a divine cardiogram on me. Do something on me where you check my heart and see if my heart is pumping the love of God for him and for people. See, I believe strongly when you know better, you'll do better. Jesus has critiqued us and has revealed some growth edges. What are we going to do with it? We are adding, I'm going to share this with you, and I'm going to close in prayer and bless you. We are adding a new element to your online experience. Um, we, this is what I know, we grow best when we are walking with Christ and with one another towards spiritual maturity. And so to help facilitate that effort, what we have done is that we have created, and we're going to continue to do this, is we've created this a discussion guide that will help you process this sermon together with your family. We don't preach to entertain. We don't preach to inform. We preach in order to bring about transformation. And one of the way, great ways you cannot transform if you don't process true on this message and really have some courageous and difficult and critical conversation. And so not just this sermon, but every sermon. And so we are creating this guide, this discussion guide that we're calling our micro church because that's what you are in your home right now. You are a micro church. And uh, we are creating this guide that, is, that you will be able to download from, the fa- from Facebook, from our app, from the website, and it will give you some questions uh, and some, um, some guidance as to how to begin to process each sermon, each week. So as you gather with your friends, as you gather with your family, as you gather with your th- 3G group, wherever you are gathering with, maybe you're doing a Zoom party later, later or a watch party later, But whoever you're watching this with, it just gives you an opportunity to stop and to process what you've just heard. And I pray that you will take advantage of that. And I pray that you will hear what God is saying. So again, I just want to challenge you. Consider what God is doing. Consider that God is saying to you, there is when you can know better. You do know better. Now we must do better. Father God, we pray that you would help us, Father God, to heed your word. Help us, Father God, to not just simply be hearers of your word, but we want to be doers of your word. We're asking, Father God, that you would take the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts, and Lord, they would be acceptable in your sight. We ask, Father God, if your word was not spoken, that you would immediately uh, drive it away from our memories, that it would have no place, that it would be wiped out of our memory banks. But if your word was spoken, Father God, I ask that you would drive it within our hearts, that you would imprint it upon our hearts in such a way that it never, ever changes, and that we are quick to be obedient to what you have called us to do. Father God, we ask that you would speak in us and to us and through us. We ask, Father God, that you would help us to know your way so we can do your way, that we would know your word so we could obey your word. We ask, Lord God, that we would know your love so we can give your love. Father, we ask that you would do that for us. Speak to our hearts because your servants are listening. We ask, Father God, that now as we go, we ask, Lord God, that you would help us to go in your grace and go in your peace. Go in your strength. But, Lord God, most of all, we ask that you would help us to go in your love, to grow in your love, and then to go in your love, and to truly change the world with the message that you have given us to follow. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Before I close, there's one other thing I just want to mention. As a part of this uh, study guide, there's going to be a short little video at the end of this. You can pause the video. You can pause the, 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 the tape right now or the, uh, your recording right now and, 
then go into your little study time. But there's a little short two-minute video, or maybe three-minute video that's going to be played at the end of this uh, recording um, that is a part of the resource of your study guide. So make sure that you stay tuned for that. Go in God's grace and be a blessing. Amen and amen. Phenomenal unemployment numbers that haven't been seen since the Great Depression or the 1.2 million Americans affected with COVID-19. Or by the time this video was done, the number of deaths that are swiftly approaching 100,000 due to this pandemic. I am asking you to not forget another pandemic that has plagued these yet to be United States for hundreds of years. Yet again, the pandemic of race. There are legitimate concerns about the dishonoring of the dead and the trauma that these images continue to bear on an already traumatized community. Yeah, I get it. Yet to those who continue to minimize the reality of our country's original and ongoing sin, I encourage you to watch the video of the murdering of 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery by two overvigilant oppressors while he was jogging. Again, jogging. I need you to see the video digest it, embrace the trauma, just as Mamie Till wanted her son Emmett Till's casket to be open so the entire world could see the evil and hatred that still resides in the hearts of many Americans. I subscribe to the same ideology. The sickness can never be addressed until it is exposed. So the next time you hear your black and brown friends scream and cry against the evil of social injustice, you will have a reference point that is 150 years after Reconstruction. This isn't repackaged or revamped rhetoric from the 1960s. This is 2020 pain that allows me, as Paul says in Ephesians, to be angry yet without sin because prosecutor George Barnhill and D.A. Jackie Johnson have already done enough. And for anyone that seems to find solace in bringing up the past of this young man to justify his life being taken, I invite you to stop listening to my music or hearing the sermon of your favorite evangelist or voting in the next election because we all have a past that exempts us from perfection, yet frees us to jog. There are good people in the world, every race, every gender, every nationality, and those of us that are strong should bear the infirmities of the weak. So while we fight to find a vaccine that helps us survive a new future we all face, let us continue to fight the virus of evil with the vaccine of love. Happy 26th birthday, Aubrey.